we have uh, another very interesting subject uh, that we need to discuss. Our industry has been subject to change uh, for a very long time. Uh, ever since uh, 2008, we've been seeing a series of change. We have a very interesting speaker to add uh, color to the evening, uh, who's going to talk to us that change is the only truth. And to, to do that talk, we have Mr. Raja Krishnamurti here. Uh, please uh, come up, sir. And can I request Nishit Desai to please escort Mr. Krishnamurti, uh, Raja Krishnamurti on the dais. Nishit, do the honors, please, by uh, giving him a shawl, honoring him with a shawl. Can we have you on the center stage, please? Can we give a loud cheer, all of us? Thank you. Raja, I'll need a minute of your time. I'm going to take a minute. Raja, incidentally, is a very good friend and a client of mine. But I'm going to take a minute because he's got a huge profile that I need to read out. Very quickly, uh, he's a thought leader. Such pleasure. Always. Raja is a HR thought leader. He does interventions. In he's a consultant and advisor. Does interventions, diagnostic studies, leadership development, and organizational development studies in organizations. He's a motivational speaker, which is fairly uh, uh, obvious now. Uh, he's a speaker and a very powerful motivational uh, person. And he's also a co-founder of a company which is uh, into HR services called Talent Maximus. At, at a personal level, his, uh, his academic qualifications are a Bachelor in Commerce and a Bachelor of Management Studies in Mumbai from the Jamnalal Bajaj Institute. He's a certified coach. He's a champion of self-awareness. His credo is uh, he continues to be a student of Vedanta, the core of ancient Indian and Eastern philosophy, the champion that the need for self-knowledge for the evol evolution of uh, the mind, that's what uh, his passion is. Raja is also a very creative person. I, uh, I believe he has 36 hours as compared to our 24 hours because he's able to pack in so much of stuff. He's a creative person. Obviously, we've seen him in movies. He's acted in um, uh, many of the movies. He is referred popularly as Kitty as uh, in the cinema. And he's also a social development activist, which not many of you may know. Raja is concerned about socio-civic cultural issues and plays a very active role. He front-ends many of these uh, activities and spends a fair bit of his time with students in the younger community. Over to you, Mr. Raja. Thank, Thank you, you so for sharing fun. our evening. Thank you. Is this voice audible till the end? OK, very good evening, friends. Galaxy, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunities, uh, opportunity to spend some quality time with this specialist in the field of wealth management. Honestly, I'm very thrilled the moment I entered this hall for a couple of reasons, because I entered and I found that my very good friend, Babu Krishnamurti, right on the stage, and that was uh, that was a you know kind of beginning point, and you know the second thing they made me sit next to the ladies. I felt very thrilled. You know, in so many other place, what a place to you know kind of begin your journey. All right, so we have a topic today in front of us: change, the only truth. So what are the few things that we may be looking at and reflecting today? Uh, even though the change word is a familiar word, we'll actually look at change a little more closely. And then this question, why change, both as an individual and as an organization, or as a profession? Understand some of the concepts, some of the intricacies related to uh, individual growth and organizational change. And of course, then we are going to look at what are those roadblocks that actually prevent us from picking up and adapting change. So this is going to be a kind of free flow. Part of it could be with some personal, you know, kind of uh, stories. Part of it could be uh, conceptual and organizational. Part of it could be philosophical. So come along, we'll take this journey. The first place, 
I'm almost, you know, kind of uh, beginning with some philosophy for the finance experts. What is the purpose of our life? Suppose this very broad philosophical question is thrown and somebody is asked, what is the purpose of life? Maybe I'll have some volunteers sitting here very quickly responding to that. Go ahead, boss. Realizing that God is existing. Can we put our hands together for this gentleman? <laughs> Ma'am, I would like to ask you, what would you think is the purpose of life? Okay, that's your description of life. So, uh, do I hear you saying that the purpose of life is to enjoy its beauty? All right, that's fine. So, let me come here. Here's a gentleman looking at me seriously. Sir, what do you think is the purpose of life? Okay. I thought I came into a forum which was full of financial specialists, but actually I walked into some kind of a Kavi Samuel and you know they are giving me metaphorical beautiful answers. Anyway, thank you so much. But if you really look at it very closely, the truth of our life is what I call as the S, M and G reality. Survival, maintenance and growth. Fundamental to all of us, physically, intellectually, emotionally. This is only truth. Everything else is something that we build up, which is okay. I think, uh, like sometimes Osho says, you know, we're not sent out here with some purpose. We make our purpose. <laughs> and if that be so, why not we just stop with survival? Why not we just stop with maintenance? How's that? We are interested in growing. I think we need to look at that a little closely. It's not growth and evolution the most common, if you call it, the purposes of our life. And I'm very consciously putting these two words out there. At one level, I put the word growth, and at another level, I put the word evolution. Because it's very simple, if you're looking at me from there, and suppose for an introduction of Raja, Babu Krishnamurti said, Raja Krishnamurti, 5 feet 8 inches tall, 78 kilos weight, shirt number 42, shoe batter number 9, Jimnan Al Bajaj Institute, MMS, and he gave you a list of 15 things, the evidential identity of Raja. Do you think that's Raja? Would you believe that's Raja? Would you accept that as Raja? No. Why? What is it that you're missing? Yeah? The persona, okay, and what would that mean, sir? Absolutely, qualities, and I think you're talking about the mindset, the emotions, the feelings, the belief systems. Perfectly, there we are. So I think as a world, we really look at life from an objective reality, which is the external reality, the material reality, or in Tamil, as we say, the Purulsar and the Vulagam the world of material existence and then there is this internal reality of ours which is the inside realities Aga Ulagam as we talk in Tamil which is all about how do we evolve so I think growth and evolution are two you know kind of very essential parts and we are both we are all you know concerned about them sure at some point of time one part of it seems to dominate and for some right or wrong reasons the assumption in the world is that people who deal with finance are really caught up with the other side, the material side. But I'm sure you're not because you're all giving me some amazingly philosophical kind of answers. So if growth and evolution is the common theme of our life, then we need to ask some very basic questions. Growth is what everyone understands. Growth is what everyone wants. And growth is what everyone is attempting to have in life. If that's our trip of life, let's look at some intricate dimensions of this growth that we are talking about. I would actually say there can be four dimensions of growing. And that will be interesting for us to look at. You know, one of the things that I keep saying, and you know, when I look at uh, the years of consulting and training work that I've been doing, and not for any kind of record producing that I'm telling you, I've been a consultant for about 30 years having worked with multiple organizations of different kinds, different services, one of the things that I've come to a conclusion 
in spite of Bajaj Institute of Management and MBA, is that if you truly want to understand management, if you want to truly understand organizations, what you need to understand is the reality of an individual. There is no difference at all between the truths applicable to an individual human being and the truths applicable to organizations, social systems, or whatever that you're talking of as collective community. So for us to understand these dimensions of growth, I think a good step forward would be to look at, for example, how does a child grow? And it'll be very interesting to see these four dimensions of growing. Let's look at a newborn child. Let's say the child is a few months old at that stage. What are we looking for in that child? You know, as the child is born and, you know, the first few weeks and things like that, the whole preoccupation as far as the child is concerned is simply about things like feeding. Is it consuming the milk? Is it sleeping adequately? Feed and its need, that's about it. Not only that, is it passing off whatever it needs to pass off? I don't think in any other stage of life, incredibly passionately, we look at the stool of a creature other than when it's a child, because that's an indication of health. So we look at some very fundamental kind of a things, but as the child takes a few weeks more, we are also starting to say a few things. A, now you know, it's now sleeping for longer number of hours, or after about a month, some kaka or kaki comes and say, oh my God, suddenly in you know, two weeks time or three weeks time, suddenly shot up in height. And as you keep looking at it, by the time the child becomes one year, some other relative comes home or some neighbor comes home, and then the mother is holding the child, and they come and say, what, now she must be what, nine months old? And then we are saying, no, she's one year, one year. But you know, itna growth nahi hua, aisa lagta hai. You start looking at the whole question of growth or progress from what I call as an incremental point of view, which is physical and evidential to begin with. It's about activity level improvements that you're focused on. And it's all about efficiency factors. So the first dimension of growth that a lot of times you're talking about is about speed, it's about size, it's about quality of some kind. And then comes the second stage. By the time the child is about two, two and a half years old, then you know somebody comes and says, tell me who's this? The child is supposed to say, uncle. Or someone says, who is that? It's a child is supposed to say, kaka. Intellectual development of the child is now in the consideration. And slowly and steadily, the emotional and the intellectual quotient development becomes a concern. And this is a stage when it's starting to get into the world of learning. And it's supposed to pick up data, information, which we'll call as knowledge for our convenience. Because that's the way we bullshit ourselves. And then we are starting to look at the whole world of effectiveness. Is this child managing a few things much better than before, beyond its physical capabilities? So the second dimension of growth, which is effectiveness, is about can it solve its own little problems? Suppose it's, I'm feeling hungry, can you go to the fridge and Baba open up the fridge and take some chocolates for yourself? Self-management, turnaround time, problem solving, conflict management. Hey, Look at the same thing. What happens in the organization? The first level of very, very effective, or first level of a good organization is when the task and activity level can produce reliable efficiency. The second level of really an, a, a good organization is when there can be managerial and team leaders' effectiveness. Efficiency of, about, is all about doing things right, and effectiveness is all about doing the right things. The same thing that happens to that little child. Not very different, isn't it? These are the two fundamental dimensions of progress in life. One is incremental, the other one is a little more impactful. Then comes two other very interesting dimensions of growth. And let's look at that. Beyond this effectiveness of problem solving and conflict resolution, choice making as you would call it, we go to the next level, which is starting to look at, are we looking at evolution? Are we looking at growth? Are we looking at change and progress in terms of externally benchmarking or internally searching? 
as you grow as a human being, I think the whole trip of life for us becomes this belief that life is competitive. Corporate world gives us a hell of a lot of dosage as far as this is concerned. Corporate world almost prescribes this as a mantra. Life is competitive, you better be prepared for that. And not just corporate organizations, educational institutions, every one of its kind of teaching, you know, kind of faculties available, every parent to their children keep giving this great advice, life is competitive. So comes this whole pitching with the external reality, which is me versus others, this whole trip. Benchmarks, standards, best practices, somewhere become the reference point. Look at the interesting thing. To begin with, it was physical, then it became physical, intellectual, emotional, then going beyond that, not just with you, but in, with reference to others, how are you doing? And then the trip continues throughout life. Usko increment mila, mujhe increment nahi mila. He is promoted, I am not promoted. He has got a car, I am not having a car. He is getting admission, I am not getting admission. And of course, so on and so forth. So this whole thing about me versus others, which we call as the world of competitiveness, being ahead of others becomes the symbol of actually growing, right or wrong. And then you have this whole definition of that, getting ahead of others as your exhibition of ex excellence, or almost saying that, hey, that's why you're an exceptional person. So far, so good. Efficiency-based kind of growing, effectiveness-based kind of growing, exception and excellence-based kind of growing. But there is a fourth dimension. Very unfortunately, not so focused, which is the existential dimension. Me versus myself. It's such a strange world that we are living in that we probably, on an average, for every human being, we would be spending, let's say, after the two or three years of preschool, another 12 years of school, that's 15, another three years of college, that's 18, and if it is post-graduation, 20, we spend almost about 20 years on an average in a grown-up human being's life in teaching that individual human being so many realities of the outside world, languages, subjects, science, history, geography, social studies, what have you. All the things about the outside world is being taught to the child, but what about what's inside? What about himself or herself? This probably is one thing which is one of the least prioritized kind of items, and this is what we are talking about, me understanding myself. And this is a progress of a different kind. I call this AQ plus XQ. You can even say AQ slash SQ. Awareness quotient or spiritual quotient, if you want to call it that way. And this part of it, the unfortunately very lowly concerned part of it, is about conscious living, awareness of the self. I would call this the evolution of the person. So we have these four dimensions if you're really talking about change. Change which is physical based, efficiency related. Change which is intellect, emotional based, which is the effectiveness. The change which is pitched with the other person externally, which is the competitive world, which you may call as the externally pitched kind of growth. And finally, what I call as the existential growth. My dear friends, we need to be geared up for all this in our life. The necessity is not just but one dimension we can say, hey, there is adequate change that is happening. In our life, we need to have efficiency. In our life, we need to have effectiveness. In our life, I suppose we need to have excellence, though I do not typically understand or appreciate the normative definition of competitiveness. Sometimes I get really worked up about it. I think we are teaching our children, our youngsters, constantly, continuously, life is competitive, life is competitive. That's good. I want to share with you one of those exercises that I do with youngsters when I do these summer workshops with them. Typically, these youngsters are there, and these are all high school students. They could be studying anything between, let's say, the 8th standard and 12th standard. And they come in, 30, 40 of them. So when I ask them as to what they want to have in life, if they had all their freedom, you know, they will say, we want to have an independent life. Oh, I see. We don't want to be dependent on anybody. Oh, I see. So what's your problem in life right now? I mean, why are you saying that? But you know, we do not have dependency. We are capable of taking care of it ourselves. We can prove it. I see. 
We are very competitive. I see. Thank you so much. So I give them this very simple exercise. And the exercise is like this. I divide them into small groups of maybe about six, seven people. And then I give them a hypothetical situation. I tell them, assume that you are sat down for breakfast tomorrow morning. And as you have sat down for breakfast, let's say the canteen boy or the waiter is coming out there to serve you a breakfast. And for the sake of convenience, we'll say it's Madras. And therefore, there's idli that's for breakfast. And this waiter or that service person is coming and you know, laying that idli on your plate. All right, as he's laying that idli on your plate, stop for a second. As you pick up the first morsel of idli and you're about to put it into your mouth, stop for a wee bit and just look at this person. For me, to get my first morsel of food today, this is the first contact, contact number one or link number one, right? This waiter is my link number one. And then go to the further links. But you know, there was a supervisor who arranged all those idlis onto that larger plate and gave him link number two. Then there is the chef, the saraka master, who actually took out the steaming idlis, link number three. But you know, he had an assistant who actually did the grinding of that ulud and that rice and all that, link number four. But you know that uh, ulud and rice and all those things for chutney and things like that were bought from the shop. There was a boy who did that, link number five. You know, there was a shopkeeper who made sure that it was available so that they can pick it up, link number six. So I tell these kids, can you go back logically like this, link after link after link, until you reach that farmer who first sowed those seeds, that nil and that udad, that rice and udad. How many links logically you must go back to identify the link with the farmer who must have sowed the seeds? I know children are really innocent and bright. They really do very, very serious reflection and work on that. And can you guess how many legitimate number of links, the largest number of legitimate links these children would have kind of identified in their workshop? Any guess? Roughly? Yeah? 50? Okay. 457? Okay. 27 very legitimate links between the farmer who planted that nil in the first place and me putting that into my morsel. 27 acts of collaboration by which I receive a simple thing like my food. I have not still talked about chutney, I have not talked about sambar, I have not talked about my shirt, I have not talked about my trouser, I have not talked about my spectacles, I have not talked about my pen, I have not talked about my shoes. If I look at just one thing that I wear every day, if I look at one day's need of mine, the truth is, I'm dependent on at least 10,000 human beings for a normal participation of one day's life. <laughs> My dear friends, is this what we need to tell our children, that life is competitive? And then who the hell is going to tell them life is collaborative? Saath mein raho. Give to each other. Celebrate life. Who is going to tell them? So this whole idea... This pitching of life is competitive is the trip that we are all on to. And organizations just love it. Why? Because you can create the greatest amount of insecurity and insufficiency in the people's mind. If you say, you know, it's very competitive, you better do that. I'm not oversimplifying, but I'm just wanting you to look a little more. So if that be so, what is the answer? I'll come to that a little later. Yes, growth is a common purpose of our life. But my dear friends, unfortunately, growth is what everyone wants, but the real growth, sadly, is what we do not manage. And I'm going to therefore give you a new perspective about managing. We are not man-aging adequate growth. And here is this growth. Organizations, are we managing? Or are we merely surviving? And I think most of the time, it's easier to survive. It's easier to maintain. But if you're just surviving and maintaining, you're not really managing. And we'll look at a new definition of this whole concept of managing. The cycle of man-aging is what we call as managing. And I enjoy this splitting of words, man-aging. You know, when you say man-aging, typically there's one response that we pick up, and that is the happy birthday to you, that aging. All of us know that. You know, again, something very funny about the human being. 
I'm sure all of us must be getting these greetings. I, I get these greetings. Isn't it, sir? Happy birthday to you, right? You know, we celebrate, right? Can you imagine every human being celebrates in his life every year a day for which he has made no contribution? <laughs> Has any one of you done any contribution to your own birth? But we just love it. Kabhi kabhi, you know, these trips are so wonderful. Of course, we should have some reason to celebrate. But if you look at it very closely, you wonder, hey, I say, kya kar diya tumne apne life mein about your own birth that everybody is celebrating and you are celebrating as if you contributed to that. I can understand any other achievement, but if you tell me that my birth is my achievement, I will start looking at you very carefully and probably take you to the Kilpo hospital. The point of cycle of managing is we are not talking about just man aging chronologically. Because that's the easiest part. We are talking about the second part, IQ plus EQ, the intellectual emotional maturity. And the intellectual emotional maturity comes from exposure to situations then there are two options you can be exposed to the same kind of situations or you could be exposed to different kind of situations when you are exposed to similar kind of situations that is the world of expertise it has got its merit 10,000 times if Sajin Chandulkar has batted in a particular way he's an expert in batting if 10,000 hours of music tuning, if A.R. Rahman has done, he's a master about that, no two ways about it. If 10,000 punches Mike Tyson has done, that's his expertise, granted. But that's the world of expertise. There is yet another world, and this is the world of exposure. Which means, not just the same or similar kind of experiences, but wide-ranging, very, very different, colorful kind of exposures that you get. I think it's a combination of experience and exposure that's very much required for wholesome evolution of a human being. So when there are situations varying, and they are, then they are either new or what you call as chain situations. New situations are what we call as the chain situations. And that's what evolution really means. Are we capable of encountering, accepting, and going through, and becoming better with chain situations? Expertise is one part of life, but can we also manage exposure along with expertise? The whole concept of man aging is the ability to combine expertise with exposure. So when we talk about the process of managing, what strikes me is the whole cycle of the organization. And I'm sure be it your profession, even if you're doing it individually, or if you're doing it as an organization, the truth about this evolution will be valid. And what is this truth? Number one, that any growth is a cyclical, ongoing kind of a phenomena. And there are two dimensions to that. The influencing and decision-making dimension, as well as the learning and feedback dimension. So, from vision to policies, to strategies to planning, to operations to executions, to task and activity completion, the whole decision-making and influencing process comes. And that leads to a delivery to a customer, product or service. Along with that, necessarily has to come the other side, which is the learning situation. Task and activity creates data. Data becomes information. Information can become knowledge. And knowledge needs to become wisdom. And if all of these cyclical things are happening adequately, then you've got a very interesting possibility. A very well-made organization or a very well-made profession enterprising capability, managerial effectiveness at the next level, team efficiency, and finally, process excellence and process quality. This is what is expected out of us, that we constantly manage this whole cycle of evolution of the organization. The question is, for this, what kind of qualities are required? At one level, we require managerial competencies, which is all about our capabilities, deployment of talent. But on the other hand, you require what I call as the right kind of culture, which is the mind stuff. So for us to have balanced growth, you need a combination of performance capability and an amazingly positive work culture. And culture is all about the mind phenomena that we talked about a little earlier. Collective minds of the organization represent the culture of the organization. So we need to get ready, my dear friends, for this truth, just like the child is, like we said, it's going through its various phases of growth. 
it's at an enterprising stage first of all and then we are trying a few things what works for us we are ready for a few experiments will this line of business work will this way of doing things work is this delivery model okay and then we become clear about it we get to the third stage which is establishing stage establishing is when we can optimize what we have put into the organization and that is a stage where we really get into exploiting systems processes in place make the maximum out of the investments go for a good run when you're doing that you think the rest of the world is idiot they know that you're doing well they're also into business competition is catching up and this is the next stage which i call as existing exiting from the current comfort level and re-enterprising and discovering all over this is the beautiful cyclical ongoing process which every organization needs to do that and somebody talked about it a little earlier to my session yes our other friend he talked about opportunity sir in his closing uh, you know remark he talked about opportunity this is the opportunity spurt that takes place and every intelligent organization picks up this possibility long and short of this whole slide very simple unless we are constantly looking at these multiple phases enterprising experimenting establishing exploiting re-enterprising as a very cyclical process it's very easy for us to get completely outdated change growth evolution organizationally is the only reality which can make sure that you're not at survival level you're not at maintenance level but you're on to an ongoing growth pathway what is our lesson from this particular slide i would say we cannot be doing the same things and in the same way and still hope to evolve or make a difference as an organization well we have many options uh, hundreds of things that we can do but the top five five six things that i will talk about thought leadership dreaming courageously the willingness to let go of the past that's a big you know kind of difference willingness to let go of the past and doing things differently customer aligned growth strategy what we finally need to do is create value for the customer so can we constantly put our ears and eyes with what's needed for the customer and keep adapting and changing restructuring deployment agility technological updating and innovation as much as required seamless learning and capability building of the organization energizing engaging positive work culture that we talked about just now quality process excellence quick response yet flawless delivery to the customer and finally value creation are we doing something much better than yesterday a very fundamental simple question are we doing something better than x-ray or are we stuck with what we did in the past and for getting stuck with the past i don't have to give you any advice i guess a lot of our friends out here do know tamil for those people who do not know tamil i'll translate it do you know my dear friends tamil this amazing language it clearly tells you where should you keep the past what is the tamil phrase the tamil word for describing the past anybody quickly that is a description what is the word terminology another iranda kalam iranda kalam are we am i right and by the way those who do not know tamil can i tell you what iranda means iranda means the dead period what is dead is called iranda kal kalam you understand in tamil with such a fascinating language the past is described as the period of death you cannot relive it every day the only picking up from the day, past that you can do is about learning and then you move on we learn from the past but we rejuvenate ourselves continuously the tamil language with its phenomenal capability and philosophical attitude talks about past as the dead period my dear friends change simply requires this beginning point which is can i do something better than yesterday and not be stuck yes culture tradition panbado all that is required but we also need to renew ourselves if this be so the question is are we constantly changing as an organization are we constantly changing as a profession are we really reinventing ourselves or are we stuck with the iranda kalam the dead past all right so where does that take real change begins with the evolution of the self 
So we looked at very simply the organizational requirement. Number one, we looked at the organization performance cycle from long-term perspective to strategic medium term to operations and execution at a current level to task and activity at a daily level and the whole cycle which has got to be that rejuvenating cycle. That made sense? We talked about the growth spaces of the organization, enterprising, experimenting, establishing, exploiting, and re-enterprising. That made sense. We also understood that we need to let go of the past and then move on. We can't be stuck over there. That's good about the organization. But an organization is run by people. And we are all organizations by our own definitions. What about us? Where are we? Are we letting go of the past? Are we rejuvenating? Are we evolving? That is a fourth dimension of change that we talked about. Remember we talked about efficiency, physical. Effectiveness, intellectual, emotional. External, outside centered. And then we said self-awareness, internal centered. My dear friends, the next few minutes I'm going to be looking at this phenomena. Are we really focusing on our own evolution? Let me look at it for a minute. Number one, do I improve or do I evolve? Number two, do I survive or do I lead my life? Do I transform? Now let me just bring a little bit of clarity to this question. I talked about the two worlds that we are trying, you know, kind of constantly trying to manage. The world of our objective reality, which is the world of our evidential reality. I call objective reality as evidential reality, which you can measure, which you can identify. And most of the time, this world of evidential reality that we are talking about is something that we perceive through our sensory organizations or organs, which means through my eye, through my ears, through my nose, through my tongue, to my touch, which means it's essentially the world of material. And then it makes sense to me to deal with that. I become intelligent or aware about that. And then using my mind or whatever that phenomena, I deal with that. Excellent. My external engagement is clearly earmarked as to how I will deal with it. But this other question, internally, how do I make the journey? And this is where the question of how do I transform? So I think the fundamental question is, we can be survivors of life, just existing, or we can be leading our life. And there is a huge difference between surviving and leading our life. The truth is, all of us are so clear about the first dimension, which is the material dimension. Let me just give you a very simple example about that part. And I'm going to use an example, you know, from, I mean, sometimes it's nice to crack a little bit of, you know, kind of light-hearted, uh, very, very uh, innocent kind of humor. Boss, what's your name? Rishid. Rishid. Okay. I, you don't mind me asking, are you married, sir? After I said, you look very young. Okay. Uh, can I ask you, uh, your children? Daughter, son? Son. Kya wo mare unka? Four years old. Naam kya unka? Ronak. Kya baat hai? Ronak. Glitter. All right? So, Ronak. So, I'm going to build up a future story, okay? Just for the sake of fun, okay? Uh, Rishid, right? Okay, so Rishid, uske baare mein, you know, I'm building up a small story. All right? And this is fast forward. Now, this is 15 years later. Okay, Ronak is now, let's say about, uh, now he's four years old. He's almost about 20. And Rishid has a fantastic ambition in life. You know what's his ambition? He wants, Rishid wants Ravnak to be a topper. Okay, nothing wrong, right? He wants him to be a topper. So he has been growing the child constantly, encouraging and saying, Beta, I want you to be the topper. Beta, I want you to be the topper. I think most of us want our children to do well, so nothing wrong about it. So this is the fast forward. This is the plus two, not plus two, the college final exams that's coming up. The results are coming up. Rishid being the pious person that he is, today is the day of results. He's just sitting in front of the God and saying, Asto, mera raunak ka, raunak ho jai. You know, he's praying there. Raunak has gone to the institution to get his mark sheets. Suddenly the doorbell rings and uh, Rishid opens the door and there Raunak is standing, beaming face. So Rishid is looking at him, ha beta, because the tension is there, no? Papa, you wanted me to be the topper, right? Yeah, that's right. Topper in the class? Yeah. Topper in the whole college? I see. Topper in the whole district? 
Oh my God, topper in the whole state? Really? Topper in India? And he breaks down, you know, tears come out of him. He says, Beda, I'm so relieved. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy for you. This was my greatest ambition in life, that you should be a topper. Now that you have become a topper, please don't study anymore. <laughs> Is he going to say that? Are you ever going to say that? This is us. This is us in our personal life. Please remember, this is us. In our personal life, there is no stopping point. Physically, you can't even help it. You will grow anyway. Thank God we will. Thank God that we don't have to give instruction to the heart. Please today, beat 64 times a minute and so that you will be all right. Or the heart telling us, hello, I feel like taking privilege leave. Okay, don't trouble me. Finish we are. In spite of us, survival will take place. Automatically, book lagega, pyas lagega, maintenance will take place. Naturally, every one of us is looking for growth. Anybody who says, you know, my whole ambition in life was to have a two-wheeler. And the day I got the two-wheeler, I told my family, please, from now, don't ask me to improve in life. Chodo. Agar chalte jate hai, to moped, moped hai, to motorbike, motorbike hai, to car, car hai, to you know, luxury car, luxury car hai to imported car, imported car hai to a private jet is much better. Growth. We are so clear in our personal life in terms of the material external realities, in terms of the physical realities, there is never a stopping, isn't it? But I'm saying, what about the meaning making of life? And this is where, my dear friends, that big change, the big evolution, the whole need, for understanding this whole dimension of life comes in. And how does this happen? Being self-aware. The beauty is in the first one, efficiency can be measured. Effectiveness can be measured. Competitiveness can be measured. But awareness can only be a sensing exercise. Awareness can only be an unfolding. Awareness can only be a personal journey. And I think it's very important for us to take this mental growth along with the material growth. Real change, wholesome change, meaningful change, evolution takes place when we are able to combine these two. But believe me again, this is no gospel's philosophy. There is a clarity and there is an approach that we can take if you want to build this along with our other requirements of life. And how do we do that? First understand what does it mean to be self-aware. To be self-aware is first of all maturity. Contextual appropriateness. Again, I'll use Tamil to describe a very beautiful term. Idam porul evil terin the sail burdal. Idam porul evil terin the sail burdal is a phrase in Tamil which just describes contextual appropriateness. Can you be relevant to every situation and be positive about the whole thing? Number one, it's a concept of self leadership. We seriously, as a society, lack the concept of self leadership. And you're going to see that very soon in a picturesque uh, representation. We have a lot of instructed followership. We do not have much of self-leadership. Just imagine most of the time, 99% of the time, you're stuck in a traffic situation in India. What happens? We continue to be stuck. Gali sabko dete hain. Yeah, the bloody passengers in, you know, in Chennai, the car drivers are terrible. Two-wheelers are the pagal log hai. Pagal sirf nahi, they are bloody arrogant buggers. Added to that are these auto rickshaw guys. And of course the police so totally corrupt. And all that is because of the damn politician. And this politician, they are getting elected by this bloody public. Public bhi itna faltu hai. We are sitting and griping and complaining. How many of us in that situation, touch your heart and honestly answer this. How many of us push our vehicle to the side, step out, actually go to the spot where the traffic jam has happened, and once in a while say, hey, I will do something about clearing this traffic. And you think it doesn't work? I can tell you, and this is not a boasting, 80% of the time I'm stuck in a traffic situation, 80% of the time when I find that it's stopping for more than 5-6 minutes, I step out and believe me, you can make a difference to what is stuck out there, if you choose to. But that's a concept of self-leadership. We would rather sit and complain and perpetuate that misery for ourselves. Ongoing ownership of the situation. We do not have a sense of ownership. That's the truth. I mean, you want me to prove that right now? I can do that with one simple exercise. 
we do not have a sense of ownership of situation and when it's a situation we have ownership about ourselves but we do not have ownership about the social community national state wise or what we call as a public situation let me just try and give a very simple example for that boss come here aap aaiye ninga na vaanga yeah vaanga pa no problem any one of you please come out here onto the stage aaiye sir thank you so much just for a simple demonstration you know sometimes i can be talking about a lot of gospels philosophical stuff but a small example can make a big difference you know aaiye boss i loved your presentation when you talked about the opportunity thank you all right up uh, you know you're going to be standing looking over there and uh, hands on the side you know my friend uh, who uh, sabd naam shrikan 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 sir all, all that i'm going to do is i'm going to do something on your back okay and you're going to tell them as to what i'm doing i'm not going to be uh, you know hitting you or you know doing anything of that kind but some very simple things chalega okay i'll be doing i'll be standing here and doing it and you are going to tell them what i'm doing is that okay okay you can stand in front of the mic so that they will hear all right so he's going to st- okay no no ah idhar bas idhar bas because they have to see also okay or you can use this uh, yeah that's fine is there a handheld mic i can give him okay to aap idhar aa jaiye very simple exercise yeah check shrikant sir is going to tell you what i'm doing behind him okay and what is this whole trip about we just talked about sense of ownership okay ek minute okay sir let me begin with a very simple one clapping yeah you got to make it into a one full complete english sentence okay you are clapping now thank you sir <laughs> <laughs> laughing you are laughing now <coughs> you are coughing now i think you are walking you are touching my left side left hand all right normally this is what you would have said you are touching me right yes 99% of the time any one of you would have said you are touching me you are little special smart they are he at least said you are touching my left hand but imagine how many of us would actually say raja you put your left hand middle finger under the third phalange of my little finger closer to the nail and you know made a contact how many of us will be saying almost none zero you know why such a beautiful thing the smallest of the nail the tiniest part one cell inside ek bal jo gir gaya to tension hota hai the smallest part of me is me not a small part jitna bhi chhota mera body ka koi part hoga it is not a separate part it is me isn't it the truth sir true but when it comes to organizations when it comes to society why are we saying but you know i'm only a small part of this whole community I'm just one of those 130 crores of human beings in India. Wonderful. I am one of the six crores of people in Tamil Nadu. Wonderful. Why are we not granting to ourselves that I am the society, I am the organization, I am the nation, I am the universe? Thank you so much for the experience. Thank you very much. Just wanted to make Thank that you. point. Wonderful. That is the ownership of the situation. So you can't have organizational ownership without this. I have taken a permission. He said, "I'll make the noise with the bell." I said, "I'll believe you as if some fire engine is coming, and I'll ignore you." So I'm going to take another ten minutes' time, not to worry. Aham Brahmasmi. That's not a, you know, religious statement. Brahmasmi, Brahma, the creative ability. I create my world. This is the clarity that we need to have if we want to be truly evolving and growing in our personal side. So that involves four qualities: proactivity, sensitivity. principle centeredness and surplus mentality my dear friends if you don't want to survive in life but we want to lead our life that's the difference if you want to lead our life then we need to be self aware and self awareness would give us this four superb qualities proactivity sensitivity principle centeredness and surplus mentality how do they operate let's look at that proactivity and sensitivity are about the method of dealing with life you could be high on proactivity similarly you could be high on sensitivity the opposite is also true you could be low on proactivity which means you could be either reactive or passive or you could be self preoccupied caught up with yourself four different ways of dealing with life comes high on proactivity but low on sensitivity this is the world of dictator this is the world of controller that's not where we want to be 
the diagonally opposite very sensitive about issues but kuch karega hi nahi this is where most of the indian public comes 70% expert commentators opinion manufacturing company you know as per the last statistics that was done for indian cricket including mandira bedi we got 4342 expert commentators we are still searching for 11 players oh ho jayega kabhi to ho jayega scholars and critics worst case scenario the spectators and hecklers of course you know cricket is most popular in india so also films by spectators happy to sit and watch happy to sit and watch aur kuch karna hi nahi hecklers you know the hecklers obviously you must be knowing the hecklers you are watching this amitabh bachchan film let's say for example diwar last scene typical indian film 20 years ke baad mein mother and son they come together nirupa rai is you know her you know mamta is shaking she is trembling amitabh is after that villains fight and all that coming slowly in slow motion she has to put out his hand and touch her hand she has to put out her hand and touch his hand she has to say beta she has to say ma tension and the music will change it will be a good end last minute tension we are sitting down at the edge of the seat and as he comes closer and closer with that slow motion as amitabh bachchan is putting out his hand and touching nirupa rai and his golden voice he says ma from behind a scream comes ma you know in our theaters that is the heckler okay we have lot of hecklers in our social system agar aap turn karke usko gusse mein dekhenge he will look at you angrily he'll say if you can feel so much and have tears i can do my screaming our society is filled lot of hecklers but my dear friends that's not our place our place is not to be the expert commentators our place is not to be the spectators our place is to be the statesmen organization and institution developers this is transformational leadership we are all entitled to be proactive and sensitive and that's the very very powerful dimension of growth and evolution and change that we are talking about same thing about principle centeredness and surplus mentality if you look at that generative mind but with convenience at random unprincipled becomes opportunism manipulation the indian politician fits into that diagonally opposite the indian bureaucrat he is very clear about the principles lekin usse kuch nahi ho sakta sab kuch nahi ho sakta hai kuch nahi ho sakta is his slogan the world of holders and withholders worst case scenario you are the beggars and the parasites i don't want to say that very loudly but tamil nadu voters mostly belong there free cooker free stove free saadi free dhoti free food and for you know marriages free thali free you know kind of decorations very soon free bridegroom and free bride just wait those who are want to get the world of beggars and parasites my dear friends the world for us the evolving growing people the visionary creator and investor that's where we need to be we have the option to be transformational leaders the challenges of managing change why we don't do is very simply out here these four final questions and it's very interesting to look at those four questions we'll start from the bottom what will others think of me this is our biggest roadblock i can change i can do things differently but you know suppose i do that what will others think of me the second mythical question i can do that but will it affect my future the third one especially in personal relationship i am willing to do something very different but will i hurt others and of course the golden question all right yaar mai try karne ke liye taiyar hu but will you guarantee that i'll succeed is there a guarantee of succeed i'll just deal with the three of them because the third one will i hurt others feelings is more personal but the first one what will others think of me is the biggest show stopper we must recognize that opinions of others are like the menu card items in a restaurant you go to a restaurant because the doorman was nice to you because the manager was nice to you because the hostess was smiling and took you to the table because the waiter almost bent halfway and gave you the menu card do you land up ordering all the 150 items no opinions of others are like the menu card items in a restaurant pick and choose and be clear what you can digest with that clarity you will overcome this phobia what will others think of me and we will be able to change go to the next one the biggest business in india astrology why 
anybody who can predict the future is making money will it affect my future you know why it's a ridiculous question because i do not have a definition of future are you talking about a two minute ahead two hours ahead 24 hours further two days ahead two weeks two months two years 20 years konsi future ki aap baat kar rahe hain the moment you don't have a definition of that it becomes the counterpoint of the past if past was dead future is an illusion i don't want to take away the objective reality of analysis and all that but let us not get over beaten by the apprehension of the future the third one will i hurt others feelings simple answer others feelings are hurt when they have to stretch their emotional and intellectual muscles to accommodate you yes stretching muscles like going to a gym it can be hurting but that helps in development vali irundal dan vaippukal yerpadum pain precedes possibilities and that clarity must be there and finally that's the most beautiful thing for every one of us but well, most of the time this is the question that we are asking will i definitely succeed and you will be saying raja that's very fine for the last one hour you have been talking from this stage you are giving us so much of you know kind of gyan will you if you follow the kind of thing that you talked about will you guarantee that i will succeed do you know what's my answer no sir i agree i will not guarantee a success you know why very simple because you and i and the 550 people in this hall and the rest of the humanity we are not godrej refrigerator we are not maruti car i am not apple laptop i am not titan watch we are not crompton fan why because when these products were made and sent into this world along with that came a guarantee card and a warranty card will not fail for 3 months will not fail for 6 months will not wait for 5 years will not get damaged for 6 years any human being delivered into the world the nurse picks it up oh my god there is a chapa from god this guy will not fail for the next 20 years anybody my dear friends human being is wholesome he is never perfect accept your humanness of wholesomeness the day we accept the beauty of wholesomeness which means what is there and what is not there has to coexist the duality has to coexist the day will have a night following the monsoon will have a summer following a male species will be matched by a female species if there is a thirst there will be water if there is hunger there will be food the duality of life makes it so wholesome purnamah purnamidam when they say purnam it's wholesomeness not perfection learn to live a life of wholesomeness do not mistake perfection of the products for the wholesomeness of life i wish every one of you here amazing success i wish every one of your meaningful life i wish every friend of yours a true evolution of life and god bless thank you so much for the wonderful time and opportunity check, check. we took thank permission. you so much yeah we took, it, took permission for some couple of questions if there is short two questions we are running short on time all right so babu says that we are running short of time two questions any two questions yes please oh that's beautiful all right let me ask you a very simple thing boss aapka naam tell me what's your name who are you ning yaar inga Oh, see an another. Oh, that's the name of our former chief minister, uh, sir. Very simple, sir. If you, you are very clear, sir. You said very clearly, okay? N P R another, correct? Inla. Let me just try, ma'am. Who are you? Yeah, quickly, Mrs. Narayan. Uh, boss, who are you? Sai Shankar. Do you see the difference in these three? He said N P R. My name. is another eh you said i am sai shankar you said i am narayani do you have a name or are you the name all right you are a chartered accountant right do you have a chartered accountancy certification or are you a chartered accountant very simple you are a husband right do you have a role of a husband or are you a husband <laughs>
Ego is the understanding and the confusion of what I have as who I am. Who I am is pure. What I have is add-on facilities. And the add-on, mele ottapatta vishayengale, thavaraha naan enri ennum boludhu, adhi ego. Kedivaha ennai patti naan ninaikkum boludhu, adhi naan. Adhi naan vithyasa. Raja, thank you so much. I'll have to renegade on my promise of two questions. You're going to be available for tea. We have a tea session after this. Sure, Babu. So any questions, we can kind of do an interaction with uh, Mr. Raja at that point in time. Please, we're running short on time. We can do it over tea. Thank you so much. We have a schedule to run. Sorry. He will be available post the session as well for tea. And then kind of we can do the... Uh, Yep, However, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Kitty on behalf of all of us for that emphasizing speech and especially the, the lovely example on transformational leadership. You, you really inspired us. And I think it's just befitting if uh, Mr. Babu Krishnamurti could kindly go over there and uh, present Mr. Kitty with a memento as a token of our gratitude. And uh, a big round of applause for him and especially I think we are all fans of his voice. Amazing voice that he's got. So glad to have you, sir.